This is just going to be a quick study about men who wouldn't be saved according to a lot of Christians and men who wouldn't be allowed to preach according to a lot of pastors. Look at Hebrews eleven six through 7. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And then in first or in second Peter two five, the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. In Genesis six nine the Bible says he was a just man. In Ezekiel fourteen fourteen, it chooses three great men to name as righteous, and Noah is one of them. It says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. However, there are a lot of preachers and self-righteous Christians today who would say Noah didn't really, isn't really saved, and there's no way I would let him preach, even though it calls him a preacher of righteousness in Second Peter 2, 5. And the reason they would say this is because in Genesis 9, 20 through 21, it says, And Noah began to be an husbandman, and planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. So Noah got drunk. If Noah was here today, a lot of pastors would never let him preach because they'd say, you can't tell me he's called to preach getting drunk like that. You can't tell me he's saved if he's if he's doing this. I've never had a problem with drinking alcohol. I don't desire it. It's It runs in my family, and I don't even drink it. But I know some people have temptations that I don't have, just like I have temptations that they don't have. Uh, Noah getting drunk proved that he got into the flesh. It proved that he was a sinful man. That's it. God said Noah was just. God said Noah was a preacher of righteousness. God put Noah in the Hall of Faith chapter. However, if he was here today, every other pastor would be too stuck up and self-righteous to even share a platform with him simply because his sin was out in the open. And theirs was behind closed doors. I mean, imagine it. If Noah was here today and he had had a great victory, you know, he obviously wouldn't be building an ark today. But if he had some great victory that everybody knew about, but then right after that, he did something crazy, like got drunk and it was all over Facebook and everything, he would be cut off from everybody. They would not allow him to come preach for them, even if he got right about it and, you know, said this was wrong and I'm sorry. It would completely ruin his entire ministry. He would be never allowed to preach again hardly for people. And that's because people are so unforgiving. And if uh, when it comes to sin that is out in the open, they think, well, this person's done forever. And that's not right. And I don't believe that's right according to the Bible. God called Noah a preacher of righteousness in the New Testament. So, in the eyes of God, he's, he's still one of his favorite preachers. Now, this next guy, another guy named Demas. There's a character named Demas you might not even realize is in your Bible. However, look what Paul calls him in Philemon 24. He says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Paul calls him a fellow laborer. And he talks about him again in Colossians 4.14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So Demas fellowshiped with Paul. And you know by reading Paul's epistles that he doesn't just hang out with just anybody. I mean, he says, mark and avoid people. He says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. He says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Paul doesn't just fellowship with anybody. And... Paul said evil communications corrupt good manners. 
but this guy Demas was one of his fellow laborers. However, look what happens to Demas. In 2 Timothy 4.10, it says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. If Demas was here today, and he started preaching with the uh, hotshot pastors and going to all those big meetings, and maybe something happened and he fell off a little bit and got caught in, up into something world, worldly. Maybe uh, he went through a divorce, and then he's, he just gets just not himself anymore. Maybe he lose, loses a little bit of faith for a while, has his faith shaken. Maybe he even starts getting a modern version of the Bible and uh, starts listening to the contemporary music and starts preaching in them kind of churches. If he ever did get back right, they would never hang him around him again. They would say, he's done, he's ruined, he's ruined forever. Because the average pastor is so scared of what people think that he would never be associated with Demas again. Even if he got right with God again and got the King James Bible back. I mean, I've seen it a few times just in the past few years where a, a pastor, something happened in his life. And he got a little backslid. He started using the modern versions of the Bible. He started doing things that you never thought he would. But then he's right back in the game again. He, he went through a time of, of sin and being backslid. And then... He got right back in it. I mean, once you get with the King James, it's rare that you find somebody that finds the truth about the King James Bible. It's rare that you get somebody that if they get backslid, they don't come right back because there's nothing like the real words of God. Even if you see them deceived for a little bit by the modern versions or something like that, you usually see them come right back to the King James crowd. And we know that the Apostle Paul would have received Demas back into fellowship. Just like he wanted to receive the fornicator, 1 Corinthians 5, back into fellowship. Just like he received Mark back into fellowship. So we know that's what Paul did. Acts 15, 39 says, and the, centuri, uh, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. So, here Paul was had such contention with Mark that he broke fellowship with him. But then what do you see in 2 Timothy 4.11? Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Paul received Mark back with open arms. Paul is the same one who said in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So for self-righteous pastors, teachers, and Christians who think they know it all, going around saying don't even that they won't walk across the street to hear this pastor because he did this, or because he did that, and so and so. Saying so and so isn't saved because he did this or that. You really need to work on taking it easy on people. People have taken it easy on you. Now take it easy on others. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, he's got some good sermons, but he did this or that. What if I said, well, you got some good sermons too, but what about when you did this and you did that and you did this? What about the time you looked at the piano player with the tight dress on? What about the time when you lusted after all the women at work even though you're a married pastor? I mean, you are a man and women dress horrible in 2021. So I know you've looked. I mean, what if we had that on the screen Showing all the times you looked at a woman you wasn't supposed to look at. What would your congregation think if they knew you were chasing tail at work every day? And I've seen that at work. A pastor chasing the women at work when he is a married pastor. But you have some good sermons though. The true thing is that we all have done this 
or that. It's just with some of us, people found out about us doing this or that. Uh, somebody else that your pastor probably wouldn't let preach or might even accuse of being lost is the Apostle Peter. Do you know how many times Peter gets rebuked in the Bible? So many times. In Mark 8, 33, it says, But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Jesus called Peter Satan. If you knew a pastor today that said something so messed up that Jesus called him Satan, he would never be allowed to preach again. They would cancel his meetings. Uh, uh, there would be a group of pastors that would call, that would get his uh, schedule and call each pastor on the schedule and tell, tell that pastor that they should cancel this preacher that got rebuked by Jesus. Uh, but Jesus called Peter Satan. And then in John 21, 6 through 7, Peter is out skinny dipping and fishing and jumps in the water when he sees Jesus coming. In Galatians chapter 2, the apostle Paul, who was a newer Christian than Peter at the time, had to get up in his face and rebuke him because he would only eat with the Gentiles when the Jews weren't around. He's kind of like y'all on that. If you see a certain preacher at Walmart, you'll eat him up. But if you're at some big Baptist camp meeting where the big shots are, you wouldn't even look at the pastor. You're scared of what the other fat pastors might think. And if you watch, watch it on YouTube, a lot of these big preacher meetings, these people are so just haughty and eat up with pride. And you can tell when they get up to go preach, all the people clapping and the look of just pride on their face. And then they got these, all these preachers st sitting behind them as they're preaching. It's sick. It's very disgusting. It makes me sick. It probably makes God sick. I honestly believe you make God sick when you act so prideful and full of yourself. I mean, who do you think you are? You're, you're preaching the Bible. You're not some big hotshot celebrity. And it makes God sick when you reject your brothers and sisters in Christ. Show me in the Bible where it says that you can stay in consistent rejection of a Christian because of something they did in the past, even you can't just stay in constant rejection with them even after they've gotten right with God. Now, the Bible does say mark and avoid certain people. It says not to company with fornicators, but if that person's gotten right, then you have no excuse to not be their friend. I don't care who someone is. I will go up to them and shake their, can shake their hand. I don't care who sees it. But your pastor wouldn't let Peter preach. Peter had to go through so many transition beards in the Bible that he would have his doctrine messed up at times. And there are certain men out there who are our brothers in Christ. They are good and faithful men. However, since they might disagree on something, they are completely an outcast. They wouldn't let Peter preach. They might even accuse him of being lost. Because of Luke 22, 61, 62, when the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. They'd say, There's no way I'm going to go hear Peter preach. I wouldn't walk across the street to hear Peter preach. Peter done denied Jesus three times in a row. You think these self-righteous pastors would let Peter preach if he was here today? They have denied fellowship with someone over a lot less than that. And Baptist pastors are some of the biggest hypocrites you will ever see. They will get up and praise Billy Graham. And Billy Graham is the biggest sellout of this entire church age. The he never was involved in some type of scandal with a whore or anything, but he shacked up with the Roman Catholic Church, who most Bible believers think is the great whore of Revelation 17. Billy Graham was not a Bible believer. 
He used the ASV. He didn't teach hell was as bad as the Bible portrays it to be. They will praise Billy Graham, who was a sellout until the day that he died, yet they would never give fellowship to a Bible-believing preacher who might have had some shortcomings or been involved in an open sin in his past. Even if he got right and has been serving the Lord for years now, they would never fellowship with someone who might be divorced and remarried or had some open sin that got out there in the past. They would they would never give a divorced and remarried guy a position in the church, even though that divorced and remarried man is much more spiritual and loves the Bible much more than the deacons who aren't divorced and remarried. Baptists are some of the biggest hypocrite Pharisees you'll ever see in your life. They love the tradition of men. And I love the old past. I love the old-fashioned way. But if the old-fashioned way goes against the Bible, or if the old-fashioned way gets, it just adds convictions that aren't, that aren't even in the Bible, then the old-fashioned way just gets in the Bible way. You know, somebody else they wouldn't let preach today would be John the Baptist. John went through a phase where it looks like he might have doubted Jesus to some people. In Luke seven nineteen and 20, it says, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were coming to him, they said, John the Bab or John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? There have been Christians and even preachers who have got in a phase where they doubted their salvation or even went through a horrible event that made them doubt God. This hurt their testimony with other Christians, and they haven't gained fellowship back since, even though they got back on track. I mean, you know the phrase, doubting Thomas? That comes from one of Jesus' disciples who doubted that it was Jesus that was risen again. What you have in the Bible is a bunch of imperfect people with some horrible things going on in their life. I mean, just look at the greatest characters in the Bible. Tougher men than me and you had all these horrible things in their life. And these horrible things, if they had done those things today, in this Christian world you're living in, they would be wrote off forever. God didn't write them off. He wrote about them in the Bible. He put them in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Think about yourself. You are an imperfect person. The only reason you're not going to burn in hell is because you believed on Jesus Christ. So please quit acting like you are specifically, yourself specifically, is one of the 24 elders in Revelation chapter 4. But you know who else they wouldn't let preach? There is a king in the Old Testament named Solomon. And they might even accuse him of being lost. But in Ecclesiastes 1.1 it says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, Solomon was a preacher. And there are a lot of good and faithful preachers today who have been divorced and remarried. They are faithful to the wife that they have. Maybe their first wife left them for another man or just couldn't handle the Christian life and she just left him. However, the man didn't want to burn in his lust for the rest of his life, so he remarried. The average Baptist would not walk across the street to hear him preach and especially especially wouldn't let him pastor. Yet they read what Solomon wrote. He was a preacher. Yet look what Solomon did. 1 Kings 11.3 And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. This was a sin to multiply wives. It was never good with God to get more than one wife. And you say, well, it was okay back then. No, it was not okay. God told them not to multiply wives. It was always meant for it to be one man and one woman. Sometimes, though, a, a husband could leave a godly woman or a wife could leave a godly husband. This shouldn't cause you to see that godly man or woman as a second-class Christian just because their, their husband or wife left them. It shouldn't disqualify them from serving God, it shouldn't disqualify the man from holding an office just because he got remarried. Husband of one wife does not mean one marriage ceremony. 
If it did, then a pastor who remarried after his wife died would be disqualified for remarrying. Think about it. In, when, in 1 Timothy, when it says the husband of one wife, it didn't give any exceptions. So if it did mean one marriage ceremony, then the person whose wife died would also be disqualified because he would have two marriage ceremonies. It can't mean that. But see, that's the exception that everybody believes. 99% of people believe that if uh, uh, the husband's wife just dies and he gets remarried, then it's okay. But if she leaves him and he gets remarried, then it's not okay, even though there was no sin on his part. Now, if the man committed adultery on his wife or just up and left his wife for no reason, then I believe that man should step down as the pastor. But if his wife divorced him, she deserts him, commits fornication against him, and he gets remarried because he doesn't want to burn in his lust, I don't believe that disqualifies him for being pastor. When he gets remarried, he's still the husband of one wife. The first wife divorced him. He doesn't have two wives. If my wife left me today, if she got divorce papers and joined flesh with another man and everything else, I'm loosed from her. And I'm free to marry again without sinning. And I would still be the husband of one wife. Husband of one wife does not mean one marriage ceremony. But what many Christians are saying is simply that if a man is divorced from his first wife, then he's still married to her and to the wife he just took. Therefore, in their eyes, he has two wives and is not the husband of one wife. That just doesn't make sense to me. How has he got two living wives when he's divorced from the first wife? He does have one wife. He is the husband of one wife. We do believe a pastor should be the husband of one wife. We just don't believe a man that's divorced from a woman and marries another has two. What many Christians are saying is simply that if a man is divorced from his first wife, then he's still married to that first wife, even though he married somebody else and had divorced the first wife and everything else. Now, if a man is sleeping around on his wife or is like that guy on sister wives, then no, he should not be the pastor. He should not be a deacon. He would be an adulterer. That should be somebody you should just distance yourself from. You shouldn't fellowship with somebody that's fornicating with multiple women at once. But if a man is faithful to the one wife he has, you have no right to look down on him or to disqualify him or to claim that he has more than one wife when his wife gave him divorce papers, joined flesh with another man, and made a vow to another man. If you have conviction against sitting under a man who's been married more than one time, then that's your conviction and there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is when you teach as doctrine that he cannot pastor. For example, this one guy said he will sit under any pastor as long as that man has not been divorced and remarried. So he'll sit under a man who uses an NIV and everything else as long as he's not been, been divorced and remarried. That's weak to me. If you would rather, there are, I mean, that I would say that's 90% of Baptists. They would rather sit under a man who teaches and preaches out of a different version of the Bible as long as he's not been divorced and remarried, then they would a real, true, sincere, hard-preaching Bible believer who's been divorced and remarried. They would take the modern Bible pastor over the Bible believer just for that thing. That's how strong that conviction and that tradition is. I mean, that is the most strong conviction that Baptists have today is about that they believe husband of one wife means one marriage ceremony. Now, convictions are good. If you have a convictions and standards, I would never knock somebody's conviction about not wanting to have a pastor who's been married more than once. 
But you just can't teach that as doctrine. You can't teach your convictions as doctrine. Now, I wouldn't want Solomon to preach for me either. His heart got away from the Lord. However, if he got right with the Lord, I would. But while he's got all these wives, these strange wives that's turned away his heart, he's not even good enough to be around because he'll get you in fellowship with these heathen women that were uh, bringing all their false gods in there. I don't go around judging everyone's life to determine if they're saved or not. I judge their life to determine if I should be around that person or not. Or if I would want to sit under them as a pastor or a Sunday school teacher. Works don't determine salvation for me. Works determine if I can fellowship with that person or not. If somebody just lives like a, the devil all the time, I need to stay away from that person. If a man gets right with God, then I have no business turning him away. I don't care what he did. Even if he has a history of stealing. I mean, I wouldn't leave my money around him. I mean, I wouldn't leave my wife alone with King David. I might wonder why he's inviting me over for dinner. I mean, you want to use common sense, too. I do believe in forgiving and forgetting, but you still got to use some common sense. I mean, if you've got a, a Christian who's gotten right, but he has a history of uh, abusing pain pills, I wouldn't have let him alone with your medicine cabinet. But still, you don't have to hold his sins against him the rest of his life. You can have some common sense, but still forgive and forget. But this has just been a quick study about, you know, take it easy on people. If we had seen all the bad things that you did in the past, then there, there'd be a lot of Christians that wouldn't fellowship with you either. It's about these sins that are out in the open, that everybody sees, that everybody's so upset about. Things like divorce and shacking up and drinking. All these sins that they get out there and everybody knows, well, that person did this and that person did that. They're not seeing the things that a person's thinking and that the person is doing behind closed doors because if they did, then that, then in the eyes of most Christians, everybody would be disqualified because every Christian is doing wicked stuff deep down in their heart. They got wicked thoughts and everything else. Just your thoughts. If people could see your thoughts, you'd be disqualified to do anything I mean nobody is perfect I mean obviously there's Christians that are living right but they still got imperfections in their thought life behind closed doors they're gossiping there's always something somebody's doing that would disqualify them in the eyes of another person you just don't know what they're doing but I just hope this has made you realize you need to have grace with people. And if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Quit acting like you're better than other Christians. Quit acting like certain Christians are second-class Christians. And you may not, well, you may say, well, I don't think they're second-class Christians. But yes, you do, because look at the way you treat people. Look at how you won't have nothing to do with this other person because of something that they've done in the past. That's wrong according to the Bible for you to do that.